How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another amazing edition of Building Out Loud, a podcast where we talk about things that all things entrepreneurship, startups, and building in public. Today, we got an amazing episode where we're going to talk about should you bootstrap or should you raise capital from investors? Yes, no, maybe so. Who knows? Who cares? We're going to dig into it. And so I'm excited to get into this topic with my co-host, Liam. Liam, how are you doing today? Say what's up to the folks. Yeah, doing good. Uh, folks probably won't know this, but we've been uh, taking a bit of a break the past few weeks. So it's nice to be back. It is nice to be back. It is great to see your smiling face. Liam trying to act brand new, though. He has this minimalist lifestyle, and then all of a sudden, he gets a new location. I got all these Toronto jerseys in the background. Like, okay, I see you, Liam. You stutting on them. I appreciate it. Uh, but it is great to be back, you know, after our little bit of a hiatus. But so this topic you wanted to touch on, should you bootstrap? Should you raise capital? Why have you in particular been thinking about this recently? Why is this on your mind? Yeah, so the reason I want to talk about this specific topic, uh, there's actually two. The first being that given the current economic and macroeconomic climate, which I have to write about every day, I continuously see this dichotomy between uh, investors who think that we've like bottomed and think you should be throwing money in the market, whether that's public or private markets, and those that are preaching financial stability. So in public markets, it's like investing in dividend stocks and in private markets, that's, that's bootstrapping. That's making sure that like the, the main priority is not growth, but the main priority is making sure that your balance sheet, you know, works out by the time you run out of cash, like making sure that you are default survival and is the term that I think a lot of people are using nowadays. Uh, so that, that'd be the first is it's a weird economic situation arguably the first time since 2009, 2010, where we've been in what could become a, a perpetual recession. And it's just interesting in that scenario to see how it's going to differ from the past 10 years, which have been, you know, growth and people throwing a lot of money into higher risk ventures and, ex you know, expecting that their ventures will fail, expecting that, you know, some companies will 10, 10x, you know, very quickly or 100x, you know, in the long term. So it's just a different macroeconomic climate. The second is selfishly that, as many people know, I've got my own startup, and we're kind of What's at the name that, of that startup. Law for startups, and you know, lawforstartups.com. Yeah, that's where you can that's where you can access our, our stuff. And uh, for for founders, it means that you can get free legal advice or not advice information. Got to got, got to make sure I don't say the wrong words there. And uh, in, and it's a weekly newsletter as well, twice weekly actually. We, we increased that two weeks ago, uh, where you can follow with the latest trends in the legal space that might be affecting your startup. So if you need some legal information that can help you with your startup, check up check out lawforstartups.com because Liam is terrible at self promotion. Back to and, you, Liam. And it's not legal advice. To be clear, it's not legal advice. <laughs> He's just sharing information and opinions even though he is a lawyer in the UK and soon to be Canada. But anyway, back to you, sir. Yeah, so the place that that company is at is, you know, we've got like just under 37,000, I think, subscribers. We've got, you know, the twice weekly newsletter. We've got all these documents offered. And I'm in a place where I've, I've got product market fit and I'm trying to decide, should I raise funds to build the next version of this company, which to me is like a SaaS offering. So people can come put in their company information, auto-generate contracts uh, and access, you know, discounted legal services. Is that, is that the right move? Is that to raise, raise VC to get that built very quickly? You know, it's not, it's not technically complex to build and to, to keep moving the company forward and to focus on growth, or is it to ensure the financial stability of the company and, focus on sales and the ads, which isn't necessarily our long-term revenue stream. You know, putting ads in newsletters isn't what this business is, but that could get us in, you know, a few thousand a week, maybe a thousand, 1500 a week. And in three, four months, that's enough to start building out the SaaS system. And then, you know, over time, that's enough to start scaling. You know, is that the right move or is it to go for VC? So that's, that's, that's a question I've been thinking about. And it's a question I've been pondering for me personally. So that's why I thought it would be a good idea. You know, if I'm going through it, I'm sure so many other people are going through it. So it's a good chance to chat about it. Love that. And just for some context, because 
you know, we do try to record stuff that is going to be evergreen content. I want to put some context on what we're talking about when we say economic downturn. So as of today, it is May 30th, 2022. And we are currently um, in, the, in a capital market that has been hit very hard. Uh, internationally, there is a war between Russia and Ukraine, which is affecting markets overseas. Um, we have seen interest rates in the United States start to raise, and they're going to continue to raise over the next few months. When interest rates raise, that means it becomes more expensive to get loans. You're like, well, what does that have to do with any of this? Well, if you're a company like Apple, you know, when you go to take out a loan, you take out huge multi-million dollar loans. So a half of a percent hike on the interest rate is a couple extra million on a loan, maybe tens of millions, if not more. So now money is more expensive. So people are less reticent to go after that money. Um, and so we also seeing all that trickle down into startups where now growth stage startups are getting much lower valuations than they have been. Um, and then earlier stage startups valuations are starting to show as well. And for context, for the last 13 years, we've been in what's called the bull market, where everything's been up and up and up and up and up. Every year it gets better and stronger, better and stronger, better and stronger. And now we're at a point where things are starting to dip down and they will probably continue to dip down. And most of the signs in the market are pointing towards a recession. One of the easiest ways you can predict this, a recession in the United States is when gas prices go up. When you see a gas price hike, that becomes a hike for everything else. That means your clothing becomes more expensive, food becomes more expensive, everything becomes more expensive. And when that happens, that means people are spending less money because they have less money to spend on things that they want because they're going to be spending more money on things that they need. And so that is a clear sign of a recession around the corner. Now, who knows? Many things can happen. Many things can change. Cryptocurrency can save everybody or cryptocurrencies can continue to tank like the Luna coin, which lost... 99.7% of its value in like a day, a couple of weeks ago. It's a lot of stuff going on in, in the economic world. And what that really means for startups is when you think about this idea of should you bootstrap or should you raise capital from venture from VCs, well, raising capital from VCs is going to look very different today than it did 12 months ago, than it did 36 months ago, right? And so now the, the actual idea about it is far more interesting because last year, VCs were throwing money at founders, giving them really high valuations. And, you know, it was, it was really like, you know, a founder's market. Founders were calling a lot more shots. That doesn't mean raising money was ever easy. Like, I should put this caveat. People say that kind of stuff all the time. That doesn't mean raising money is easy. Like, that's just not a thing. But if you were raising money, you could get better terms than we had seen before. Well, that's probably not going to be a thing anymore. So it's a far deeper conversation. And so that's just me giving some context on the economic, you know, market that we're seeing. Liam's probably rolling his eyes because he actually writes about this every day. So he's probably the better qualified person to talk about it. But it's okay. I had to steal a shine for a moment. But with all that, let's get back to the topic at hand. Raising capital from investors versus bootstrapping. And for those who don't know, I will put some... Um, I will come back to that too and, and try to clarify. When we say bootstrapping, bootstrapping means you are going to build your company with just the money you make from your company. You're not taking any outside capital, outside of maybe some bank loans and things like that, but you're going to do it all internally. You're going to keep as much equity of the business as possible and grow organically versus raising money from investors where you're going to give away some equity in your company for the ability to get an influx of capital or influx of money so that you could potentially grow faster. That is the question at hand. Liam, what are you going to do? And really, I should ask you, where are you leaning and why? Yeah, so for me, I think I probably took a very practical approach to it in that I kind of modeled out what both scenarios would look like and which one better suited what I was trying to do and was overall better and i'll caveat this by saying that one of the things that people probably want to consider that i necessarily haven't fully considered is the difficulty as you mentioned of raising vc just having been there and having connections like i know that there's people i can reach out to and talk to and that for me the process and the time investment of raising vc is probably significantly less than someone who's doing it the first time or what it was for me six seven years ago when i first did it 
Pause, so, pause, time out, time out. Go for it. Just want to inject here. What Liam is saying right there about raising capital and how it would probably be really easy for him as he sits in front of me with his taco meat staring at me is 90% of like early stage fundraising, like your very first round of fundraising has a lot to do with your network. And Liam, because he's been in this business for a while, has a network where if he wanted to raise capital, he knows who to talk to and what they're looking for to make it happen which makes this conversation slightly different than a founder who maybe it's your first time ever having a startup, your first time ever raising capital. You might not come from, you know, a top tier college like a Stanford or Harvard or what have you. You might not know a bunch of rich people. Just know that means you're going to spend a much longer time building those relationships to raise capital, which is going to be a lot harder. So just some context here. And I'm just playing, con I'm playing like Mr. Context for this conversation. Sorry about that, Leo. Back to you. Yeah, I think I think that's it's very important context. For me, it's like it's a very different proposition than what I did the first time. So the first time I raised, and I've talked about this before, like we had these like massive like French glass doors in our office. And I literally like had a list of no joke, at least 700 names on those, which were like alumni of my university, alumni of my high school, people who I had like second connections with on LinkedIn, investors who I just thought were a good fit. Like that was an insane list. And like one by one emailed them and like crossed it off or phoned them. And like it got to the point where like when we were getting enough replies, we physically mailed things to them. Like it was a, it was a very tedious, like months long process before we got like any money into the company. And that is far different to where I'm at today, having built relationships, having proven that I can build a company, having, you know, knowing, knowing what investors are looking for. Like that's, that's another like big difference is if I want to ask Mac for money, I know like exactly what your check size is. I know the type of companies you invest in and I know what you're looking for. Like that wasn't a thing. Like seven years ago, if I had a list of investors, I'd have to go search all of that. And that takes a lot of time and, you know, contacting the wrong people is, is a massive waste of your time and theirs. So, so that's, I think that's very important. It's like my calculation of like what this is going to take out of the company is very different from a first time in, like founder who might not be able to focus on their business for the months that they're raising. For me, I have a short list of people who are interested in the type of product I'm doing, interested in the stage and interested in the check size that I'd be looking for. So that's, that's a very different proposition. So I want to, I want to contextualize that by saying, I, I, I'm just at a different stage to what some, some listeners will be at. Others might be at the same stage I'm at where they'll, they'll know exactly who to go to. But for me, what I did was I kind of mapped out. So I mapped out, if I raise venture capital, first of all, what am I going to spend it on? I think everyone should do that. That's one thing I see a lot of founders do is they're like, they'll look around, they'll see similar companies and like the check sizes they raise and the valuation they raise. They're like, I want that. And I think that's a horrible way of raising VC. You know, what I did was, you know, I sat down and I said, well, what, what was the first hire I would make? What's the first spend I would make? And you keep going until you reach... You know, in my mind, the way I do is I go until I reach a milestone, whether that's, you know, a million in annual recurring revenues or that's, you know, a thousand customers, like whatever, whatever milestone you think will get you to the next stage of raising. I kind of just map out what I would need to do to get to that. And then my rule of thumb is to add 15 to 20% on top of that, just in case something goes bad, you just have some money like in the bank. So I, I did that route for VC and for me, it took me to where the company, I think, wants to go. I did the same for, you know, bootstrapping it. And to be honest, bootstrapping it seems like a lot of time spent on sales for a product that isn't, is going to last, like in the short term, just to raise capital to then build a product that I want without having the funds to then market it properly. And missing out on the fact that because I sell to founders, you know, having VCs and having, you know, venture capitalists involved in the business is actually really, really advantageous from a pure business perspective, not even from a financial perspective, but like, you know, Mac has a big network, you know, Jason would have a big network. Like these people who I know have massive networks and they already have entire brands geared towards, you know, attracting and selling and providing services and value to the exact people I'm trying to do the same for. So, you know, for me, that was a major consideration was the fact that there's big, big value add and the venture capital side as well as just the financial benefit. So for me, obviously you can probably tell I'm leaning towards the VC side, uh, but I think I think that's kind of like the calculation that you should make as a founder is what, what does the path look like down route A? What does it look down route B? And which one of those am I most comfortable with? Which one makes the most sense for the business? Because as we said, 12 months ago, the VC scene was very different. 
So in a lot of ways, you have to kind of map out what's best for you in the next 12 to 18 to 24 months. Because, you know, what happens if the, the war in Ukraine, for example, ends and, you know, all the oil sanctions disappear and, you know, supply chain issues sort of fix themselves and suddenly you're not looking at a massive, you know, two-year recession. You're looking at, you know, a three-quarter or four-quarter recession and suddenly in 24 months, you know, everything's back up and running and, you know, back in a bull market and everything's going well. You know, maybe having bootstrapped for a few years, getting to a place where you've got traction, you've got customers, you know, you're in a really good place to raise capital in a few months, in a few years from now. You know, so you, you got to kind of think it through in that way about where you're trying to go and where you want to be. Uh, but definitely in like this market, the idea of having a self-sustaining business is very, very attractive. And I think, and, and Mark, you, you better to speak to this, but I think even if you are going to go the VC route, your plan should result in whatever fund you're, funds you're raising, having a sustainable company at the end of that. I don't think you should be counting on subsequent rounds of funding in the current market. I think that unless, unless you're a very, very high tech company doing something completely out there, that as best as possible, you should be aiming for some sort of profitability with the funds that you're going to be raising. I completely agree. So first thing I'm gonna I'm attack I'm a, I'm gonna tackle that last piece that Liam was just talking about about having a company that is sustainable you know we have been in a bull market for so long where there's been so much money flowing to startups where founders can literally keep raising capital to buy customers right you could spend more money than for customers than what they were actually get, paying you back to buy growth and get to a point where you could actually get to a successful outcome that can still happen today, but it's going to be a whole lot harder. And it's going to be a whole lot harder because yes, at the early stage, so I am the founder and managing partner of Rare Breed Ventures. We do pre-seed, the seed investments. We do early stage stuff. Every now and then we'll do a series A, rarely we'll do a series B, but we do all early stage. And so at the early stage, valuations and things are more art than science, right? We're, we're figuring out, hey, what do we think this company could be valued at? The problem is, once we set a valuation to your company at that early stage, our true, the, the, the money and returns that we make happen when you get to an exit. And we're hoping that exit is an IPO. So if I say, hey, your company is ready, is worth 5 million today, I'm hoping that you're going to IPO for a billion, you know, 17 years from now. The problem with that in a market like today's is when you grow and get to that growth stage and you're ready to go into the public markets, it's no more art versus science. It's all science. It's all based on your numbers. It's all based on your revenue, your EBITDA, your metrics. And you're going, it's going to be based on the comps in the market. And so if you look at the market today, where all these tech companies, their valuations are dropping, then that means the top in value that a company can have is now significantly lower than it was four months ago. And so that means the potential outcomes that we are going to be trying to calculate towards in the future, we now have to suppress and bring them down to make them much lower. And so that means for me to get the true value I want out of your company is I can't give you a $20 million valuation in your first round anymore because the chances of you getting to a $5 billion outcome is far less today than it was just a few months ago. And so instead of you having a round where you're getting 20, you're going to get rounds where you're going to get 10 or $5 million valuations. And now that we know that the market, the high end is going to be far more conservative, that means for those companies that are looking to go public in the near future, let's call it the next three to four years, then we know that the emphasis on revenue um, and churn and spend and all these other things is gonna be a whole lot tighter. So people who had they IPO a year ago, might've gotten a two or $3 billion valuation. If they were going to try to IPO today, maybe 750 million. That's a drastic difference. And so those are real things to account for. And so then that means if you want to get the highest possible valuation in the future, that means you're going to have to have, you're going to have to build your company in a way that when you get to that point where you're ready to go public, that you have a sustainable company and speaks well to those metrics for you to get the valuation you want. Or you'll get acquired by, you know, another company who are also going to be suppressing valuations of companies they acquire 
so they can save money, right? It's just where the leverage is. And so the emphasis on being profitable is going to be significantly higher over the next few years than it has been. And so founders need to be very cognitive of that. The other thing I want to talk about is this initial point of bootstrap versus raising capital. And, you know, Liam talked through the, the mental gymnastics he was doing to try and come to a conclusion. There is a great book that founders should read. It's a bit dated, but still valuable. It's called The Founder's Dilemma. And The Founder's Dilemma is a book that talks about this idea of wealth versus control. And that's really what we're kind of talking about when we're talking about should you bootstrap versus raise capital. So first and foremost, when you raise capital from investors, you are literally gaining a tool to grow your company faster. That's all it is. Like getting money from VCs does not mean that you're going to be a successful company. It, it doesn't actually validate your company. It is literally you gaining money as a tool to grow faster. That's it. But this idea of wealth versus control is when you get investors, you're now giving up some equity. And once you get VCs, you're probably going to get a board. And when you have a board, that means there are going to be other people in your business that have voting rights. And voting rights can very often trump equity stakes. Like founders always worry about, I, I want to have the most equity in my business so I can control my business. Well, you better look into the covenants of your business because when you raise money from investors, sometimes those covenants have it set up so that voting rights are actually more impactful than your equity stake. Ooh, we want to talk about that in another podcast. Anyway, so that's the idea of giving up control. But historically, companies that have raised venture capital or have raised capital along the way tend to be the companies that have the highest outcomes. Where on the flip side, if you do not take outside dollars, then you will then inherently probably grow slower, but you will retain all the control in the world. And even though you can train, you contain all the control in the world, it typically means you're going to bring down the top in value that your company will be able to acquire over time. And this is just historical data showing us this is just like inherently what it is. And so these truths of wealth versus control battle against each other. Now there's a nuance in that. Just because you build a company that gets to its highest end in value doesn't mean that you as the founder retain that value. You have to be along for the ride and maintain equity in the business along the way for you to make sure you get to that outcome, right? Now, you could say, hey, I'm going to raise capital. I'm going to step away as CEO, but I'm keeping my equity in the business. Good deal. When they get to the big, when they get to the promised land IPO, you get a big check. There's a lot of people though, when they get to that point, they're like, well, forget this. I'm taking my, I'm, I'm going to just take a big payout and leave. Well, the company itself will still get to the high end value and the best it possibly could have. But you as the founder may not get all that value. So there's a nuance within that, but founders should, all founders should read the book, The Founder's Dilemma, and really start to think through these, these dynamics of wealth versus control. Now, me as a venture capitalist, I will tell you, if you have the opportunity to take money from an investor and it can materially help your company grow faster, it's probably a good idea. And it's a good idea because if you don't take the money and you have competitors that do, you may find yourself in a war where your competitors, where they start to eat up so much of the market share that you may look up and three or four companies that you know you're better than have now eaten up a significant portion of the market and made your top end value so much lower than what it could have been because you didn't keep pace with the market. And sometimes to keep pace with the market, you need capital to do it. And the capital is not just to get ads and get customers, it's also to get hires, it's also to be able to get top tier talent, it's also to get top tier C-level suite you know, members, like all those things come into play. But if you're like, look, Mac, I don't want nobody's, you know, all up in my business. I don't want nobody telling me what I should or shouldn't do. I got advice. They can give me advice, but I don't want nobody having no power. This is on me. Hey, I respect it. But I will tell you one secret. And Liam probably knows this really well. If you see 
these folks writing blog posts and sub stacks and medium articles and tweets and stuff and LinkedIn posts talking about how important it is to bootstrap and how their bootstrap founders and they'll never take VC dollars. Little secret there is many founders who have bootstrapped their companies didn't bootstrap them because they wanted to. They ended up bootstrapping because they weren't able to raise capital. And then we're just able to figure it out and, and, and was able to get to the other end. But that wasn't, a, that wasn't their actual goal originally. But they'll tell you it was. But I know plenty of them where I could pull out some receipts. Yeah, I think that's true. I think at least from my experience, I think every single bootstrap founder that I've met uh, at some point wanted VC. I think, you know, there's, there's different stages where some of them might have wanted to hold off for a while or where some of them went for it in the first round and then didn't get venture capital and then decided to forego future rounds. Uh, but definitely everyone of us at some point tried to pitch a VC because, because to be honest, it's no one gets into this high tech, high growth type of company and industry without wanting like that multi-billion dollar valuation. Like no one's getting into it to get like, you know, a company that's turning over a few million a year and like you can open a corner store if you want to do that. Like you don't need the stress and you know, the impact of building like a massive software or hardware company to do that. I'd say there's, there's three things. I think founders should keep in mind based on what you said. Number one is when you're looking at VC versus bootstrapping, control is obviously important and equity is important, but it's also important to think about the pure financials. And what I mean by that is it's better to own 100% of a company worth 100 million than 5% of a company worth a billion. Like if you ask someone, do you want a company that's worth 100 million or a billion? Most people choose a billion, but like, what are you giving up? as you get there and is that going to make up for you know what you could have had if you bootstrapped it so i think that's one thing to consider for founders is you might lose voting you might lose equity but like how much value are you actually retaining it is actually better to own 100 percent of a smaller company than to own a small percentage of a bigger one uh especially in you know in this type of economy where you can always choose to raise funds in the future when the markets are looking up instead of you know investing when they're taking money when, when they're looking down. I think a second point when it comes to control is that in the current market, it's a much, much bigger question than it was a year ago. Because as Max said, companies that might have been raising at a 20 million valuation might raise at a 5 million valuation now. And if you're still raising a million dollars, that's the difference between giving up 5% of your company or giving up 20% of your company. So you're giving up a lot more control today than you were a year ago to raise the exact same amount of money. So that's a very important consideration to make is that you might, you're not only losing equity, you're not only losing, you know, financial value, but you're actually losing a lot of control. And if you're going to continue to raise three or four rounds, you know, that's the difference between you finishing, you know, a series D with 40% of the company and finishing a series D with, you know, down at you know, 20 15 percent of the company like you're you're, you're gonna it's gonna be a very very significant difference as you keep going down the line it's why a lot of people you know warn that you shouldn't give up too much in the early stages because it does really come to hurt you once you get if you you know to a series c series d series e so that that's another thing to consider and then the final point i'll make is you don't necessarily need to bootstrap but one of the things that you know a lot of a lot of the data shows is if you're somehow able to skip one round, just one round, that it makes a significant difference when it comes to control. It makes a significant difference when it comes to founder exits. That means just at some stage, whether it's like pre-seed, seed, A, B, C, if you can essentially have your company grow so quickly or have some new innovation in the company, or just have something happen that gives you that cash influx that allows you to skip raising a round, you're saving yourself losing 15 to 20% of the business in that one round. And down the line, that's a massive, massive economic impact for you. So you actually look at like the companies that IPO where the founders make significant exits. A lot of them have only raised three or four rounds. Uh, the ones where founders have raised six, seven, eight rounds. The founders, you know, they might IPO for 40 billion instead of a billion, but the founders actually walk away with significantly less money. Because a lot of those times, those founders are actually some, sometimes own as little as like 2 or 3% of the business by that point. So trying to skip around, if it's possible, 
uh, is actually beneficial to founders in a lot of situations. And it's something that you should consider, obviously, do the mental gymnastics every time you're thinking about, you know, what the best course for your business is, especially in today's market. Yeah, that's something that a lot of founders should be considering, especially if they've already raised, let's say, a pre-seed round or a seed round. So I'm talking to founders who, who might have raised in the last year and raised with the intention to grow. If you still got like six or 12 months of runway, this is like the perfect time for you to reconsider whether or not you want to use that runway or if you want to find a new business strategy that extends that to let's say 18 or 24 months and helps you be a bit more profitable in, in the short term because that could actually end up being the best thing for a business in the long term. So should you bootstrap? Should you raise capital? That's a personal decision. I don't know. It's a lot of things that go into it. And hopefully, you know, we can help give you some things to think about and chew on. But at the end of the day, got to do what's best for you and your business. Liam, you got any last words for the folks? Yeah, I think if, if anyone's in this situation and is listening to this, you know, you've come back to this a year after it's come out and you need an answer to this question, I would say just my best advice I could give is to sit down and to map out what both features look like, map out how much money you can expect to make if you bootstrap it, who you're going to hire with that, how you're going to spend it, and just go down the line for 24 months and see where you end up and what the company looks like. And then do the same for VC. Like how much, how, what would you spend it on? What, how would that affect the company? What are the outcomes? And see if at the end of those 24 months, which outcome makes the most sense to you. And don't forget to factor in the time investment of raising venture capital. If you're a first time founder, like please budget at least like two months of full time work. Cause that's what it is. Like if you don't have connections, you don't know who to reach out to, you, you haven't spoken to VCs that you're building con like connections completely from scratch and relationships completely from scratch, you know, that's going to take time and factor in the odds that it's not going to work out, that you're going to invest all that time, two months full time, three months full time, and you're going to get nothing at the end of it. Like you, when you, when you factor in what the VC route looks like, that that's the reality of it especially if you have no connections and no relationships. Because I can say from personal experience, even the first time I raised venture capital, I, I've never in my life raised from someone who I didn't know for at least two, three months before they gave me a check. Like at the very, very least. And that's even like investors who I went to, went and talked to a whole bunch of other people and then came back to. But like you, you cannot expect that you're just going to send a bunch of cold emails out and you're going to get replies. You're going to have a phone call and the, like money will be in the bag in a week or two. Like I know that there's stories of that happening in the past like year or two, but that's not the norm. And that's, those are outliers and they're definitely, definitely far less likely to happen in today's economy where VCs are happy to sit on their money. Like you can sit on it and make a decent amount now just having it in a bank. Like that's what higher interest rates do. And people are far less likely to spend on higher risk investments when they know that, you know, money in the bank is now potentially returning, you know, I think my bank's offering like 4% now if you give it to a year, which is completely absurd considering last year is like 0%. But, you know, that's, that's the reality for founders is, is it's going to be a lot harder to raise capital and you need to factor in the odds of failing, you need to factor in the difficulty of it. And, and that should help guide you towards which, which path is better. But think 24 months down the line and what both paths look like for you. I think that's the best way to make the decision. Wise words from an incredible man. Thank you so much for that, Leo. Also, if you have any thoughts or any ideas or anything you want to share with us, please feel free to tweet at me and Liam. Email us your questions. Reach out. We are here for you. If there are any other topics you would like us to talk about on Building Out Loud, please send them our way. We are always looking for topics. We're always looking to engage. If there's anybody that you think we should have on as a guest, we don't tend to do guests too often, but every now and then we could pop up with something unique. You never know. So please reach out to us, let us know, and hope everybody have a wonderful day. Peace out, y'all.